Although the very concept of informed consent was established during the period that these studies were taking place in the form of the Nuremberg Code of Experimental Research Ethics, the practice was by no means universal. The Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, for its part, which saw infamous Nazi doctors prosecuted for horrific experiments conducted on Jewish prisoners in particular, actually received little coverage in either the Canadian or American press. And according to historian Jay Katz, even scientists who were aware of the Nuremberg Code often viewed it as, quote, a code for barbarians and not for civilized physician investigators. When interviewed in May 2000 about the fact that dental treatments were withheld from children, Pett, for his part, distinguished between his experiment and one that would be considered unethical by arguing that it was, quote, not a deliberate attempt to leave the children to develop cavities except for a limited time or place or purpose, and only then to study the effects of vitamin C or fluoride. But regardless of whether or not the studies met the ethical standards at the time, it's clear that they did little to address the widely recognized causes of malnutrition identified in residential schools, which always boil down to a lack of funding for proper food service, and that for many of the students taking part in the study, the regular physical examinations that went along with the experiments could be confusing, painful, and sometimes traumatic. While the voices of the children themselves are often silent in the documentary record, a series of letters sent, by Pet, sent to Pet by the pupils of the Alberni Residential School in 1952 provide some insight into their experiences. While ostensibly being sent <clears throat> by the students to thank Pet and the researchers for their visits to the school, it is clear from their content and the similar form of each letter that Pet had asked the teacher specifically to have the students provide a list, <clears throat> sorry, a list of all the foods that were not available in the school but that the children were looking forward to eating when they got home. You can see at the bottom, this is one of the students' lists. This was part of a larger study that PET was conducting concurrently with the nutrition experiments that sought to ascertain the long-term effects of residential school experience on children's eating habits once they left the schools. The letters from the students at the Alberni School listed a broad range of both store and country foods that they were looking forward to and often included a number of common items like homemade bread, fish eggs, duck soup, seaweed, seagull eggs, herring, pie, cherries, and alphabet soup. In addition to these lists, most students also took the time to include other messages to the research team. In addition, <clears throat> these range from simple statements like, quote, thank you for the medical you gave us, to the more ominous, tell the nurse I said thank you for the poke she gave me. Many of the children, for instance, complained that the nurses wrote down the wrong age on their charts and were upset that the nurses would not change them. One child who complained of having the wrong age recorded also added that she, quote, didn't understand the words Dr. Brown was saying. I was listening very carefully, too. An even more common and troubling <clears throat> theme of the letters was that many children wanted to reassure the doctors that their tests were not painful. One child, for instance, wrote that, quote, the pokes I got didn't hurt me very much, and that I got a couple of my teeth out by the dentist, but it didn't hurt very much when he pulled them out. Another student wrote, quote, thank you for all the pricks you gave us. I hope we are going to be healthy all through the year and not take so many teeth out. We will all try not to get sick. The fear involved in the clinical interaction between doctors and students was perhaps best captured by the student who wrote, when the nurse pricked me, it did not hurt me at all, but a little part of it is showing yet. I hope I am okay. Perhaps tellingly, the same student's letter, which I've showed here, also included a correction that appears to have been added afterwards, in which the student's statement thanking the doctors and nurses, quote, for what they have done to us all, was changed to, quote, for what they have done for us. While many of the students thanked the researchers for coming here to help us be strong and well and healthy, it was clear by the end of the study that the benefits were disproportionately skewed towards the professional interests of PET and the other researchers. For children like those who developed anemia during the course of the study, moreover, the risk to their own health often far outweighed any possible benefits they may have received. Ultimately, it seems that none of these experiments or studies conducted between 1942 and 1952 had much in the way of a long-term positive effect on the lives of those being studied. 
There's little evidence, for instance, that the experiment started in northern Manitoba was ever actually finished. But even if it was, the results do not appear to have been published in a scientific journal. Some of the results of other experiments in residential schools were presented at conferences or workshops or published in journals. But they too seem to have had little effect on the operation of food services in residential schools beyond those that took part in the study. And they seem to have had little effect on the scientific study of nutrition overall. Reports continued to come in, in fact, regarding the poor food service in schools not including these experiments. In 1953, for instance, Indian Health Services received reports from carpenters working at the Brandon Residential School in Manitoba that the children, quote, are not being fed properly to the extent that they are garbaging around in the barns for food that should clearly be fed to <clears throat> only to barn occupants. A situation largely confirmed by a subsequent surprise inspection. In the end, it was only in 1957 that the largely inadequate per capita grant system that had governed the funding of residential schools since 1892 was replaced, replaced with a more consistent controlled cost system. This new system gave Ottawa the power to audit the schools. It was funding and for the first time, the federal government had some direct say in the quality of food being served at the, in the institutions through a system of formal standards and inspections. Yet as historian John Malloy has argued, even the new system was far from effective and allowed the persistence of both neglect, abuse, and hunger. Nearly a decade of experiments and studies on Aboriginal foodways and malnutrition appear similarly to have done little to alter the pre-existing assumptions held by federal policymakers and bureaucrats like Pett and Moore. Both continue to argue for expert-driven technological solutions as a means of easing this so-called transition from traditional to modern foodways. And in many ways, such attitudes simply fit within the technocratic and paternalistic ethos of Canada's administration of Aboriginal peoples during this period. The 1950s, after all, saw the Department of Northern Affairs and Natural Resources attempt to socially engineer a solution to the so-called Eskimo problem of hunger and dependency in a number of Inuit communities by quote unquote experimentally relocating them without their informed consent to unfamiliar and often unforgiving new Arctic settlements. As has since been well documented, the result was not only profound social and cultural dislocation, but in the tragic case of, and I apologize for butchering this pronunciation, the Aharamut of an Endai Lake, the result was also hunger, starvation, and misery. The decision to engage in such brazen social engineering, of course, came from the same mindset that drove Tisdall, Moore, and Pett to con conduct their own scientific experiments. As Northern Affairs Executive Officer <clears throat> Robert Phillips wrote to the Deputy Minister in 1955, it was useful for the department to, quote, think of 9,000 Eskimos as a laboratory experiment and give the imagination full reign on what might be done to improve the culture. Indigenous peoples, in other words, continued to be seen as experimental materials in their communities as laboratories for both scientific and social experimentation well after the experiments of Pet, Moore, and Tisdall had ended. Perhaps the most significant legacies of these studies of Aboriginal nutrition during the 1940s and 1950s is that they provide us with a unique and disturbing window into the ways in which, under the guise of benevolent administration and so-called charity, Bureaucrats, scientists, and a whole range of experts exploited their discovery of malnutrition in Aboriginal communities and residential schools to further, <clears throat> to further their own professional and political interests rather than to address the root causes of these problems or, for that matter, the Canadian government's complicity in them. This was made possible in large part due to the persistence of the false perception that First Nations had somehow been left behind by modernity and were therefore in need of the benevolent hand of settler scientists, experts, and professionals. As Paulette Regan, the Director of Research for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, has forcefully argued, real truth and reconciliation can only occur when settlers genuinely begin to understand and take responsibility for the legacy of systemic violence and oppression that characterize the residential school system and Indigenous settler relations in Canada more generally. These experiments must be, therefore be remembered and recognized for what they truly were. One among many examples of a larger institutionalized and ultimately dehumanizing colonialist racial ideology that had governed Canada's policies towards and treatment of Aboriginal peoples throughout the 20th century. Thank you.
Sure. Any questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, so uh, Dr. Mosby will take questions. Um, well, we can take a brief pause if anybody needs to leave before the Q&A starts or wants to get juice or coffee or cookies if there's anything left there. Um, you all look like you're saying quick, though. <laughs> all right. Well, let's go right to it then. Um, I think it's probably easier if you just recognize hands. No problem, yeah. Yeah. Before I get things going again, um, <laughs> you have you know, <clears throat> you beautifully laid out a rather appalling record on the part of uh, scientific community and authorities in Canada. I'm just wondering, you know, if, if you have any sense, uh, if we were to, com is, there a, is it possible to compare what was going on in Canada with the European experience and treatment of Aboriginal peoples, and, say, by the, in the Soviet Union? or in Scandinavia or whatever. Is, have you come across anything that would give a sense that could place the Canadian experience in a more comparative um, in that period? Yeah, much of, much of the comparative literature I've looked at has mostly been in the, the context of North and South America. Um, but you know, this is, these experiments are occurring at the same time as the Tuskegee syphilis experiment in Southern United States also occurring at the same time as um, the syphilis experiments being conducted by the US Department of National Health, I believe, on indigenous peoples in Guatemala. So there is, there is a larger context of um, you know, similar abuses being done by scientists to, to indigenous peoples in the, in the context of North and South America, for sure. I yeah. know about uh, the difficulties you encountered in your research. I'm looking at this, these uh, records and thinking, where did you find them? What happened? Was, you, was it easy stuff to find? Were, you, were things hidden from you? Uh, difficult in times? Yeah. Well, uh, as it turned out, I really stumbled upon these records. Um, you know, this, this project was, you know, I didn't go in thinking that this is what I would find. Um, but to a certain extent, the records were hidden in plain sight. They, you know, these were not enclosed files. Um, most of the files that I used to, to do this research, um, you know, I did not have to apply for access to information requests. But they were in the files of things like the Federal Nutrition Division that so far historians haven't been interested in um, until recently. And so I was simply the first historian to start looking through the files and, and discovering these experiments. Another <clears throat> part of it as well is some of these files that I ended up putting together, I, you know, I had to broaden my, the scope of my research as I tried to figure out what was going on. It, and um, some scholars had also looked at the same files as I had, but because they um, you know, were not trained in the, in the history of science, I think they didn't see the experiments for what they were. I think they just saw them as, as studies and not, not um, not controlled experiments. And so, you know, I was just, long story short, I was very lucky to have found them and to have recognized them. Yeah. I seem to recall from the newspaper reports that 